Hey everybody, Buster Chops here, and well, 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 looks like the uh, tensions are rising in the South China Sea. So we've got a story here from the New York Times. U.S. warships enter disputed waters off South China Sea as tensions with China escalate. <clears throat> The move comes as a war of words between the United States and China over the coronavirus pandemic intensifies. So we're just going to read through this article here, and I'm just going to give some comments on what I think about uh, what is going on and my opinions on certain things. So if we see here, American warships have sailed into disputed waters in the South China Sea, according to military analysts, heightening a standoff in the waterway and sharpening the rivalry between the United States and China, even as much of the world is in lockdown because of the coronavirus. <clears throat> So the way that this here starts clearly has a bias. And this is what I don't generally like in my news. I don't like bias, uh, biased writing. I like it to be as uh, down the middle as possible. So here we see American warships have sailed into the disputed waters in the South China Sea. And subsequently, it is the American warships that have heightened the standoff and sharpened the rivalry. But as we'll see, that's not really true, because it's not like the United States just sent ships into an area that was completely stable and everything was going wonderful. Not only that, but uh, sharpening the rivalry between the United States and China, I think that the whole uh, coronavirus and the lack of information from the World Health Organization and the Chinese government about the status of the virus and how it spreads and uh, how communicable it is uh, has probably done a lot to sharpen the rivalry anyway. The America, an amphibious assault ship in the Bunker Hill, a guided missile cruiser, entered contested waters off of Malaysia. At the same time, a Chinese government ship in the area has for days been tailing a Malaysian state oil company ship carrying out exploratory drilling. Chinese and Australian warships have also powered into nearby waters according to the defense app experts. So here we see in the second paragraph, it wasn't just these U.S. ships going barging in to an area willy-nilly. A Chinese government ship has been in the area for days tailing a Malaysian state oil company ship. So there was already some threat, whether real or perceived, by the Chinese government and them sending ships out into the area to tail Malaysian ships. So it seems as though the U.S. presence is more of a response to the Chinese government's presence there than just them going charging in, trying to bully everybody around in the area. Despite working to control the pandemic that spread from China earlier this year, Beijing has not reduced its activities in the South China Sea. Yes, despite working to control a pandemic that they caused. See, we're not putting that in there, right? It's just, oh, a pandemic that it happened to spread. It's the passive voice, right? It's a pandemic that spread from China earlier this year. It couldn't have been anybody's fault. It couldn't have been known. It just, poof, it just happened. There it goes. It's spreading around. Not that it was caused by the Chinese, likely from a virology facility where they have poor, um, poor handling procedures and likely allowed the virus to escape. No, 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 that couldn't be it. It's that it just happened, right? And, and they've been working oh so hard to control it, right? So hard because everybody's safety is their top priority. Yet, they have not reduced their activities in the South China Sea, a strategic waterway through which one-third of global shipping flows. Instead, the Chinese government's years-long pattern of assertiveness has only intensified, seeing military analysts. Now, this is the key thing, okay? It is the Chinese government has had years-long, and we're talking years-long, we're talking decades-long patterns of assertiveness. They have been systematically um, working their way into other countries, right? They're buying up properties, they're buying up assets, they do all sorts of stuff to try and extend their influence as much as possible. You look at them setting up the 5G networks, it's going to give them access to all sorts of other countries' information. 
the Chinese government is very deliberate in what they're doing. This is one thing that they do very well. Okay? They, far more than democratic nations, have long-term plans, and they work on those long-term plans unceasingly. And that's one of the benefits of being a tyrannical dictatorship, is because you're in power and you don't have to worry about re-election. You can ultimately set a plan in place where you say, okay, this is going to pay off in 20, 30, 50, 70 years. Because you know that you're going to still be there working on that plan and you're going to ultimately see it come to fruition. Maybe not you personally, but your party, the, the country, is going to see it come to fruition. In countries like the United States or other Western democracies, um, you have situations where these people have to consider what's going to get them elected again, oftentimes in four or five years. So they can kind of make a plan that's going to last three to five years, but they have to make it something that's going to still allow them to get reelected. So they can't set something in motion that they say, okay, great, 30 years from now, here's where we want to be. They, If they do that and then they lose the election, somebody else comes in, you're three to four years into your 30-year plan, and poof, it just gets kicked out the door by the next government. Okay, so... It's very easy for these dictatorships to set their long-term plans in motion. And because governments of other Western democracies are focused on internally maintaining their power, their grip on power, they don't necessarily have the ability to see and react to these long-term plans, which is why we see China having grown so much right now. And by grown so much, I mean in political influence and economic influence. So, it's quite a deliberate Chinese strategy to try and maximize what they perceive as being a moment of distraction and the reduced capability of the United States to pressure neighbors, said Peter Jennings, former Australian defense official who is the executive director of the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. This is exactly right. It's a deliberate strategy, and they've been working on this for decades. Uh, as long as I can remember, I have been telling people that when... They went into Iraq and Afghanistan and all these other places, and we've got North Korea. I've always been saying, watch out for China, because China's playing the long game, and they're a serious power. They're a serious powerhouse. And if you're not careful, right now, so much stuff is being done through China. And I'm not the first person saying this, and I'm not the only person saying this. But so much stuff is being done through China, as far as we outsource um, Everything that we build basically comes from China. So with so much outsourcing, they have tremendous power over the West's um, supply chain. And we're seeing it now, right? We're seeing the effects of it. When everything shuts down in China, everything shuts down in the West. Since January, when the coronavirus epidemic began to surge, the Chinese government and Coast Guard ships, along with maritime militias, have been playing, playing contested waters in the South China Sea, tangling with regional maritime enforcement agencies and harassing fishermen. Yes, because earlier this month, the Vietnamese accused a Chinese patrol ship of ramming and sinking a Vietnamese fishing boat. So China literally throwing their weight around, right? Literally running over Vietnamese fishing ships. Of course, that's, you know, what the Vietnamese say. I'm sure the Chinese would dispute it. And we can all trust the Chinese to be very honorable in what they say. Last month, China opened two new research stations on artificial reefs it has built on maritime turf claimed by the Philippines and others. The reefs are also equipped with defense silos and military-grade runways. Nothing suspicious there, right? Nothing to see here, everybody. Return to your homes, move along. Nothing to see. Okay? This is area claimed by the Philippines and others, and China has just moved in. They've built some uh, reefs and built defense silos and military-grade runways on it. Over the weekend, the Chinese government announced that it had formally established two new districts in the South China Sea that include dozens of contested islets and reefs. Many are submerged bits of atoll that do not confer territorial rights according to international law. And it seems that even as China was fighting the disease outbreak, it was also thinking in terms of its long-term strategic goals, says Alexander Vuving, a professor at the Daniel K. Inoue Asia-Pacific Center for Security Studies in Honolulu. That is a mouthful. And this is what people should never forget, okay? 
They are always thinking of their long-term strategic goals. Okay, when the uh, when the coronavirus broke out, that is secondary to them. They don't care about that. Okay, you might even argue that strategically, <clears throat> it would be worth it for China to infect a bunch of its own people and deal with that as they move along because they know that the, the chaos that it's ultimately going to cause in the West, the West will again freak out because the West is soft and the West gets scared very easily. And we can see that. We can see how people have reacted. Uh, it's just an over panicked uh, sense of freaking out, right? Just everybody just needs to calm down. Okay. But they know that the West is going to freak out they can release this virus, and I'm not saying they did. I'm just saying strategically, they could release this virus knowing that there's going to be an overreaction. And then while they all turn insular, China continues to press its advantage, which is what we actually have seen here. China pressed its advantage. It keeps reaching out and taking more and more territory. The Chinese want to create a new normal in the South China Sea where they are in charge. And to do that, they become more and more aggressive. Exactly. After the sinking of the Vietnamese boat, the State Department urged China in a statement to remain focused on supporting international efforts to combat the global pandemic, and to stop exploiting the distraction or vulnerability of other states to expand its unlawful claims in the South China Sea. But why would they? Why would they do this? They want to expand their claims in the South China Sea. And nobody is stopping them. They take land and they set down roots and they say, this is our land. And then everybody's releases a the state department releases a statement saying oh please you should be remain focused on supporting international efforts to combat the global pandemic and they go you know what screw you we don't freaking care okay that's what they mean but they say oh yes this is a very important thing that we need to resolve right but they don't care they just keep pressing their advantage and they keep pressing and they keep pressing the Chinese government has made vast claims to the South China Sea that conflict with demarcations made by five other governments. An international tribunal has dismissed most of China's claims to the waterway, but Beijing does not recognize the ruling and has instead built naval bases on reefs it now controls. So again, we see, oh look, this statement really slowed them down. They really gave a crap about that. Okay? The international tribunal says, stop that. This is, your claims are without merit you should step back and they just go oh that's nice yeah yeah you're you're so cute trying to stop us but you know what we're here now and we've built naval bases and we're just setting up routes now try and stop us try and stop us while the united states has no territorial claims in the south china sea the american navy says it has kept peace in these waters for decades american military officials have chastised china for its increased militarization of the waterway oh there you go again right we're chastising you bad china bad so bad through our continued operation and then china hangs its head in shame and they feel so bad they feel so terrible and then they take another island and they set up another military grade runway through our continued operational presence in the south china sea we are working with our allies and partners to promote freedom of navigation and overflight and the international principles that underpin security and prosperity for the indo-pacific said lieutenant commander nicole schwegman a spokeswoman for the United States Indo-Pacific Command. The U.S. supports the efforts of our allies and partners to determine their own economic interests. The Chinese government has countered that the United States is the country destabilizing the region. The appearance of the America in the Bunker Hill may do little to, this, to dispel that narrative. Here again, we see bias. Right? The Chinese government has countered. It's the, it's the United States destabilizing the region. And the appearance of the America in Bunker Hill do little to dispel that narrative. But this whole article so far has been talking about how China has just kept moving forward and moving forward and taking more and taking more, right? They've ignored international tribunals, which have basically said, you don't have any claims on this territory. And Beijing doesn't recognize the ruling. And yet here it says, oh, it's the America and the Bunker Hill that are uh, causing that destabilization, right? That's ridiculous. That is ridiculous. The destabilization has come because China's pressing its advantage and they keep exerting force where they have no legal right to exert force. And when somebody responds, you can't say then that they are the instigator. 
Regional governments have worried that the United States has a habit of briefly showing up in hotspots only to depart, leaving them to contend with an increasingly muscular Beijing. And this is accurate. Okay, This is something that I think has merit. The United States, when they come in, they shouldn't just make a little show and then vanish. And by my nature, I tend to be fairly isolationist. I do not like the idea of getting involved in other countries' business. Okay. However, the issue is when you've got a massive country with the largest population in the world, and they are a tyrannical dictatorship who seeks, actively seeks, to gain more and more control of more and more land with more and more resources and more and more money, and they want to build up their military, and they want to expand their global influence. You have to do something that is going to stop that. Okay? Now, we've seen that political, um, political statements don't really have much effect. We've seen that international tribunals and their legal rulings don't have much effect. And ultimately, it comes down to you have to have the backbone to stand up to a bully. You have to, because if you allow them to just get bigger and bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger and stronger, they will ultimately, uh, when they have the advantage, they will press it. They will make a move once they have that advantage. So you can't let them get that advantage. Now, does that mean I think they should go to full-scale war? I'm not saying that, but I'm saying there comes a time when you have to say Full-scale war it is, right? And if you can stop it before it gets to that, that's great. But if you can't, it has to be done. And everybody is always so keen on saying, and I say this as somebody who's never been in the military. So uh, I put that up front. These The people in the military are freaking brave beyond belief as far as I'm concerned. But most of them have signed up because they're brave beyond belief and because they believe in these tenets. But... There comes a time when you have to say, the, the line is here. This is it. We, we will go no further. And if you cross it, then there's going to be an issue. Right? So what is the intention of the U.S. here? This is Ian Story, a South China Sea expert at the IC's Yusuf Ishak Institute, a think tank in Singapore. <clears throat> Is it just to say we're here, or are they going to shadow the Chinese survey ship to try to stop it from, from operating? The United States Indo-Pacific Command did not specify the exact location of the ships, but it did confirm they were in the South China Sea. On Tuesday, the United States Navy posted pictures of the warships to Twitter, accompanied by a third vessel of destroyer called the Barry, saying the expeditionary strike force was operating in support of security and stability in the Indo-Pacific region. The area where the American warships have been sailing is around 200 nautical miles off the coast of Malaysia, defense experts said. Malaysia, China, and Vietnam all claim rights to the natural resources in this part of the contested waterway. Well, we know that China is going to have a reasonable and measured response, and they're going to give Malaysia and Vietnam uh, every possibility and every chance to exert their control over those natural resources as well, because China just works that way, right? They're so nice. They're so thoughtful. And consider it. Just ask all those people in Hong Kong. Ask all those people on the social credit system that are no longer allowed to own phones or have internet or take the bus, right? They're very reasonable, very understanding, and very considerate. Last week, a Chinese government survey ship began shadowing the West Capella, a drill ship conducting exploration activities off the Malaysian coast and operated by Petronas, the Malaysian state oil company. Uh, the Chinese survey ship called the Haiyang DG-8, had previously tracked similar oil operations off Vietnam. Uh, Australian frigate, the Paramount is accompanying the American naval ships. Mr. Jennings, former Australian defense official, said the Paramount's deployment would have been scheduled for last year. Uh, let's see here. Blah, blah, blah. The destroyer is called Wuhan, named after the city where the coronavirus began. Here we go. At a time when China has been sending doctors and personal protective equipment to Malaysia to combat the viral -like epidemic there, the Malaysian government has not publicly protested the Chinese survey ship's activities or its security cordon of armed Chinese Coast Guard vessels. I wonder why that might be. 
Do you think maybe it's because China has been sending doctors and personal protective equipment? And that maybe if they haven't publicly protested, that they have perhaps said something behind the scenes to the U.S. saying, look, we're getting this stuff, but we're not feeling very comfortable about what they're doing in our water. So do you want to send a, a vessel or two over here just to freaking make your presence known? I'm not saying that's what happened, but I'm saying that could be what's happened. We don't know. Uh, the prolonged presence of Chinese maritime militia and Coast Guard ships in another oil-rich area off Malaysia has not prompted an official protest either. Again, just because there's not an official protest does not mean that there has not been a protest. It also doesn't mean there is a protest, but it doesn't mean that there hasn't been a protest. Beijing has been dispatching medical supplies, and this doesn't mean that Vietnam might have said something. So maybe Malaysia's like, hey, we're just going to keep our mouths shut. And Vietnam says, we're not keeping our mouths shut. We are going to say something. Beijing has been dispatching medical supplies and expertise across the region and has boasted in a military publication that not a single member of the Chinese People's Liberation Army has come down with the coronavirus, an eyebrow-raising contention given the epidemic's rapid spread. Yeah, I'm sure this is 100% true. Nobody in the Chinese People's Liberation Army has come down with the coronavirus. Not a single person. I'm telling you. They're, it's like they're immune to it. Right? It's just like, poof, it slides off them like water off a duck's back. They come in contact with it, and poof, it just freaking runs away, screaming in terror. Okay? An American aircraft carrier, the Theodore Roosevelt, which had been sailing in the South China Sea earlier this year, was struck by an outbreak of the coronavirus that killed one sailor, sickened hundreds of others. Other ships in the United States Pacific Fleet have been infected as well. So clearly, that's just that the Americans are far, far worse at dealing with it than, uh, than the Chinese. Because the Chinese, look at this, they've had nobody. Nobody. Nobody's even come down, never mind dying. They haven't even come down with it. Okay? Come on, step your game up, United States. The optics for the U.S. Navy in the region don't look so good, even as the Trump administration is trying to reassure its allies, said Mr. Story of the IC's Yusof Ishak Institute. They tell us again. China can say, look at our superior governance system, which has beaten back the ep epidemic. And of course, we can all believe that. And then look at the U.S., right? So again, they say, oh, the optics for the U.S. Navy don't look so good, right? When it's China that's doing everything bad. China is the one throwing their weight around, and the United States seems like they're just going in there to try and get the Chinese to back off a little bit. But here's what I have to say about going back to a point previously. When it comes to war, everybody says, oh, we don't want war, we don't want war, we don't want war, because war is so terrible, and the suffering it causes is so horrible, and it is. Okay? And I'm not saying it's not. But war can also be good. And everybody seems to forget this because war is hell, as people have said. I think it was Patton that said that, but I don't want to be quoted on that. But when you look at ultimately the suffering which goes on and which may be, um, which may occur in the future, there is a strong case where you can say, that although if there is a war, there will be a massive and very concentrated um, bout of horror and death and maiming, the long-term suffering will be far, far less. So if you go into a war to stop a tyrannical dictatorship from becoming stronger and from expanding its influence and from... Um, from stomping down on its citizens that will cause suffering but when you factor in the 10 the 15 the 20 the 50 years down the road the ultimate amount of suffering is going to be less because those people will have been saved from being under the boot of tyranny okay there was a story i read just today as well that china is number one in the world for executions with thousands of people being killed each year. Now, maybe those people are all deserving of death. Maybe they've all, they're all terrible, terrible people who have committed horrific crimes. But I tend to doubt it, knowing what I know of the Chinese government. I tend to think that a number of them are probably political dissidents that the government just wants to get rid of. 
So when we look at situations like that, or we look at the social credit system where people have serious limitations placed on the quality of life that they can live if they don't buy into and support the Communist Party, that is no way to live. Okay, For me, the number one thing is liberty. I want to be free. And if that meant that I had to risk dying so that I could live in a free country and my children could live in a free country and their children could live in a free country, that is a price worth paying. And we have seen again and again that Western armies and Western armed forces are willing to pay that price to ensure liberty and freedom. Uh, and this is what the U.S. needs to seriously, seriously consider because we've seen now how much effect the Chinese government can have on the Western uh, supply chain, how much effect they can have on the Western's, uh, Western countries' access to medical goods, uh, both medicines themselves as well as ancillary goods like masks and suits and things like that and respirators. And ultimately, you need to make a choice. Do you want to be in bed with someone who will be your enemy, who is your enemy, just to make a few bucks? Or do you want to take a stand for what is right? And those are my thoughts on that.